Bishop Melchak, uh, my brother priest, deacons and our deacons' wives, our seminarians, and lay leaders from across the diocese, and our beloved religious. It's a joy to be together today, to have the family more fully expressed as we enter into the sacred triduum. Earlier this week, I encountered uh, a family and their son had a significant wound on his leg. So he was uh, wearing shorts and the abrasion, as you looked at it, was pretty, pretty unsightly. And so I asked, what are they prescribing? What, what's the treatment for this wound? And he said, well, just to put Neosporin on it and the healing process will take place. We think about things like Neosporin, Polysporin. What we use today as a simple means of healing where you, you have the wound and you put an ointment, a balm, an oil, on the wound that allows it to, to still breathe but not be affected by the other elements and allows healing to take place. This use of the oil of healing, of course, goes back, the oil for healing goes back to biblical times and will be one of the sacramentals that will be blessed today, the oil of healing. And the oils today, healing, chrism, catechumens, serve for us as a template for our life as the local church. Because they connote healing, mission, and new life. Healing, mission, and new life. And if we are agents of healing, if we are faithful to the mission to share the good news, then we have confidence that new life will result. And so today I'll offer a reflection on the oils in the context of our life as a local church so that we can have greater clarity in this year, in this time, as to how we can live more effectively as God has called us to be. The oils remind us, our sacramental life reminds us, you know, there are no virtual sacraments. We're drawn together and the use of oil, bread, wine, water, imposition of hands happen in this intimate encounter. The oil of the infirm, the oil of the infirm. Now, of course, this oil will be used for the sacrament for the anointing of the sick. And as we reflect upon this last year, certainly physical sickness has abounded. We've experienced it, we've touched it. There's nobody in this room, I'm sure, who doesn't know somebody who has at least experienced COVID, if not died of COVID. The healing balm, the use of the anointing of the sick for those who are in danger, for those whose health is so compromised by age or weakness that they need that healing anointing of the sick. So certainly, uh, you know, we can understand this on a sacramental level in terms of the ministry that we priests have to be able to bring the anointing of the sick to those who are infirm. But for our wider church, the notion of healing can connote even more than that. We are grateful for the work of our Catholic healthcare system. So many men and women who have worked so hard with great sacrifices, faithful to not just their medical practice, but to the mission that God has entrusted to them. More broadly, we have families in need of healing. We have our own hearts in need of healing. We have community in need of healing, and we have our own church in need of healing. 
Because over the course of the last year, increasingly we have found ourselves fragmented, separated. We've done our best to keep the virtual connections and as the pandemic has shifted to be welcoming and to invite people back, but in our hearts we know we're not all back together. You know, the family has not all returned yet. And the healing that needs to take place, both physically and spiritually and emotionally, to not just bring us together as a church, but to look even into the wider community and say, wounds have been exposed over this last year. The wound of racism has been exposed. And it can be difficult to look at wounds. I mean, it, it was, you know, to kind of look and say, oh, look at, you know, wow, that, that must hurt. How did that happen? What can I do? When we think about our societal wounds, we as agents of healing have a unique opportunity as bearers of the gospel of Christ to bring a word of hope and healing and reconciliation, that there is no unforgivable sin, that the Lord is the Lord of mercy, and that we can share his love in the world. And so, you know, what can happen sometimes is we can just move on to the next date in the calendar and the next event that's before us and the next responsibility that we have and the next something we have to do, and we don't look back and fully absorb the healing that we might still need and that the world still needs. And so it's, uh, pray God, an opportunity as our society opens up even more and more and more, pray God as the pandemic recedes, we shouldn't forget that the wounds that have been exposed over this past year and the alienation that perhaps has occurred, we have a responsibility to be ministers of healing. The most iconic passage in this regard in the scriptures is the Good Samaritan from the Gospel of Luke. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim poured oil and wine over his wounds and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn and cared for him. By the way, notice, you know, what's wine? I mean, rubbing alcohol. What's oil? You know, Neosporin. I mean, it's the same kind of stuff we're using today. But that seeing, you know, Pope Francis talks about peripheral, he talks about seeing people on the margins. And so, and on the peripheries. And so if we think of, of you know, peripheral vision, you know, if you put blinders on a horse, all they'll see is what's right in front of them. But if you remove them, the peripheral vision expands, and so you can see those who are hurting. And the question for us this year won't be who's in our pews, it'll be who's not in our pews. Not who do I see in front of me, but who's not there? Who do I have to look to to ensure that they're welcomed, embraced, healed, and know that they're a part? will soon sing, there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole, to heal the sin-sick soul. May we be agents of healing. The oil of chrism denotes many things, but it does mark one for mission for mission. Chrism seals baptism. It confirms the Holy Spirit in confirmation. And it anoints and consecrates in the priesthood. There's the baptismal call of all the baptized. There is the distinctive responsibility of those of us who have been confirmed. I mean, confirmation really is to mark and does mark that greater fidelity to mission, that greater response that all of us in the body of Christ take up our responsibility and share the good news. And share the good news. So it is the responsibility for all of us to be to be faithful and, and listen to, you know, this is Jesus quoting Isaiah in reference to himself in the Gospel of Luke. It's the passage we just heard. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. So it's our responsibility, our, our joy, to be able to let people know in the midst of a hurting world that there is hope, that Jesus loves them, that we're here to reach out to them, to invite them, that the Jesus who we know, who has given our lives purpose and meaning and joy and healing and hope, is accessible to them. Because if we, if we think we will be passive recipients of those who simply come to us, that model, if it ever was valid, would certainly be outdated. Because the mission to invite others into a loving relationship with Jesus, to share with them the good news, to give them hope and healing, to give them confidence, to let them know the joy of the gospel is part of all of our responsibility. As we're faithful to mission, we will see new life. It's a joy to have uh, some of our seminarians here today and seminarians on the way. It's a sign of hope for the future. But it does bear noting that a pain for all of us this year is that one of the oils that I'm about to consecrate will not be used in the way that, pray God, it should be used every year because we won't have a priestly ordination this year. And so the oil of chrism that is also to be imposed when a priest is ordained may likely go unused this year for that purpose. And it's worth calling that to our attention so that we can be ever responsive to inviting and to fostering a culture of vocations. And soon, brother priests, will be repeating, renewing our priestly promises. And as we live those out more fully and faithfully, pray God that the Lord, through our action, through the actions of all of our deacons and our laity, will call forth through the witness of our lives, the witness of the lives of many men and women, more who would seek to serve, more who would hear the call, to respond to the ministerial priesthood. The oil of catechumens. New life, growth. New life, growth. So the oil of catechumens is used to prepare one more fully who is not baptized for baptism. You know, if you think of those movies like, you know, like Gladiator and stuff like that, before they enter a competition, what do they do? They kind of get oiled up, you know, like you, you kind of like you're getting limbered up, you're getting ready, it's about to happen. So you, so you use the oil to get you ready for what's next. The oil of catechumens is only used on those who are not yet baptized. And so the more we use that oil this year, the greater sign it is of the, of the growth and the hope that the Lord wants for all of us. There's the new evangelization, which in many ways is kind of recalling back those who have already received the gift of baptism who are not fully living it out. But the basic evangelization, which occurs in families who pass the faith on to their children, who see to it that they are baptized. And that will occur this Easter vigil when we have those elect who as adults have said, I want to be baptized and are entered in. The right of election here in which those men and women in their own name say, yes, I want to be baptized is one of the most beautiful ceremonies of the year because you are encountering people who were not baptized and who now say, I want Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I want to be baptized. And so if we, if we are agents of healing, ministers in our own lives and the lives of those around us of the Lord's healing. 
that should renew us in our faithfulness to the mission that we have been given in baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. And if that happens, the oil of catechumens comes into play. May we be confident, joyful missionaries whose lives are so attractive that others will look at them and say, what, what, you, what you got, I want. <laughs> what is that? You seem so loving and kind and healing, and you offer a word of reassurance, and there's, there's a world that's kind of gone upside down, but you seem to have held, held on to something in the middle of that. What is that? And we need to be prepared to give an account for the hope that was in, is within us, to say, I'm not a perfect person, but I love Jesus, and I think... He's blessed me in many ways, and I just have confidence that it's going to be okay, and can I say a prayer for you? And then those people that are kind of on the margins, who aren't even remotely close to this building or our church edifices, may come a little closer and a little closer and a little closer, and not that it's like a membership club that we're just trying to increase our numbers, but we have what we know the world needs, and that's the saving love of Jesus. Go make disciples. <laughs> We've heard that. That anchor, that vision that we as a local church will go and make disciples, fulfilling the mandate, is still before us today. In Isaiah, we hear today this exchange that takes place. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we can live this out? And we can't. to give them the oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. That's the anointing that the Lord wants to give all of us. Gladness over mourning, a glorious mantle over listlessness. And the beautiful thing is we're not on our own in this. We pray God will have great plans and strategies. We'll work hard. And, and we'll think about the best way to accomplish all this. But what the oils remind us of today is that it's not just on us. <laughs> Far from it. These sacraments, these sacramentals that will be brought forth from the oils remind us that it's the Holy Spirit working in us. It's the Holy Spirit using us. And so we should call upon the, the power of our sacraments. Lord, you baptized me, so I know you're with me. Lord, you have confirmed me. And so I call upon the power of my confirmation because I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now, but you do and your Holy Spirit is in within me, use me. Lord, you ordained me a priest. Lord, you ordained me a bishop. And I know that your word will not go unresponded to, that your saving action will have an effect. Right now I don't feel it, but I need it, and I believe it's there. So, Lord, I call upon the power of the sacraments you have given to me. Lord, my marriage is feeling loveless and frustrated and full of tension, but I know that you were there when we exchanged our vows. I call upon, we call upon the power of our sacraments. We call upon the power that you give us in the Holy Eucharist, that you nourish us and you feed us. There are no virtual sacraments, but the reception of the sacraments is something that we can call upon any day, any place, any time. Elsewhere in Isaiah, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall do what pleases me, achieving the end for which I sent it. Yes, in joy you shall go forth in peace, you shall be brought home. If we're agents of healing, if we remain faithful to our mission to spread the gospel of Jesus, there is no doubt that God will bring the new life. If we are agents of healing, if we remain faithful to our mission to spread the gospel of Jesus. There is no doubt that God will bring the new life. 
May we all make our own the words that Jesus proclaimed those years ago. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me.